okay, let's say you're having a, an interview for a new teaching position and you get this question. What is teaching? What would you say? What would your colleague across the hallway say? Would there be inconsistency in the answers? Would they be in totally different spaces? Do we actually have that conversation on what is teaching? And I know that throughout my career, I have progressed and thought differently about what teaching is, what it looks like, what the role is. And I think a lot of us grew up watching movies and we saw teachers to be a certain way. We watched movies where teachers would stand up on desks and they would inspire their kids and all of these other things. And sometimes I think some of those portrayals actually focus more on the teacher in the classroom than the learning that actually happens because of the teacher. And do we look at that? And I'm not saying if you are a teacher that gets up on desk and gets really excited that you're a bad teacher, not at all. But I think sometimes we kind of have a vision of what teaching looks like, but we don't necessarily have the conversation. And that's why I was actually really interested in this conversation that I just had with Andrew Maxey, who wrote this book called Elephant in the Classroom, Tracing the Complexity of Teaching by Exploring 13 Competencies and Practices. Because of all the conversations that I've had, I think just asking the question, what is teaching, is one that I don't know if I've ever actually had on this podcast. So I think not only is this a great podcast to listen to, but I think it's a great question to consider, to have uh, with your colleagues, with staff, with each other. I'd love to hear your thoughts if what is teaching, and Andrew would actually share that, uh, you probably couldn't put the answer in a YouTube comment, but you know, I, I would love to hear your thoughts. So if you're on YouTube watching this, I'd love to see your, your comments down below when you think what is teaching, maybe even write them before you hear what Andrew has to say, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. We went in so many different directions, uh, talked a little bit about football, talked a little bit uh, about some of the mistakes I made in my teaching career and how I have kind of progressed in my thinking, not only with teaching, but how we see technology Great conversation, really loved it. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kuros and welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And today I actually have uh, Andrew Maxey, who is the Director of Strategic Initiatives in his school district in Alabama. He's, he's taught in several places uh, across the United States. And he actually has a new book out that just was released at the end of 2021. It's called The Elephant in the Classroom, Tracing the Complexity of Teaching by Exploring 13 Competencies and Practices. And so I'm really kind of excited uh, to kind of dig into this book, hear more about it, some of the stuff that you found through your research, through your writing. But Andrew, if you could just introduce yourself uh, to the audience and who you are, what you do today, and, and how you got to that point. I love it. Thank you so much for the opportunity, George. And so, uh, yeah, Andrew Maxey, and I work here in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, obligatory roll tide. Uh, <laughs> right. And I, I sit there, I can see the stadium from my office window. Oh, wow. So it's, oh, it's, yeah. It's, I forgot it's, that. It's, that. They're in the, so we're recording this before the national championship game, right? Well, but I mean, let's just go ahead and say <laughs> what has already happened. There's, right. There's no doubt. No. <laughs> okay, well, hey, this is recorded now, so it's going to be after the game. So we'll this is either right. age well or badly, either exactly, way. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, so I'm here in Tuscaloosa, and as you said, I'm Director of Strategic Initiatives here for the district. It's a really cool opportunity to be part of some stuff that has is designed to have a big impact on kids, such as the work we do around summer learning. Like, we're trying to uh, we say normalize summer learning, which uh, right. means to us, uh, kids aren't required to come at all. Mm -hmm. But we've been doing this work over the last three years where uh, parents send their kids anyway, and, and kids are dying to come, um, and we use the national model. So there's that. Uh, I work with our librarians, and uh, I just got to put a plug in, like, I, I honestly don't understand how, at least in the United States across the country, we somehow think that we can build strong readers and let our libraries die. Like, that's right. not how it works. Kids right. need lots of books and they need professionals. So we're trying to do that work. And then there, there are other projects along those lines as well. Uh, I, I've taught in three states, including Alabama. I started my career in rural Indiana. I taught in San Diego, just the last exit before you get uh, yeah. to the international border. Um, and look, talk about three really different experiences uh, teaching in those places. Um, yeah. But for me, that really informs 
some of my thinking and even the work in the book that uh, the circumstances, the details, the application of teaching varies and can vary quite a bit. But but teaching as a profession that there's uh, that that is common. It's it's the same across uh, all contexts and and I I would argue across uh, subject areas even. Um, So the book is an attempt uh, to say, just answer the question, what is teaching? Uh, because we don't have this common snapshot. Uh, we all know what's in there. Mm-hmm. But I think not having that common picture of teaching allows us to forget it, to forget the complexity when we make decisions about teaching mm-hmm. um, and then just continue to pile on layers of more complexity. So the purpose of the book is to say, look, here, here's a map and and let's look at it. And then if that really is an elephant, that we don't talk about, which is how complex teaching is. So what should we do about that? So right. that, that's, the, that's, uh, that's the, where the book came from and what it, I hope it does. Well, and yeah, and I'm excited to dig into this more. I got, I got a couple other questions for you before we get into it though. I, right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you about um, the comment that you made about librarians. And I agree with you. Right. But I also know, and I, I don't know if you say, but, or, and the, the, the role of the librarian uh, has, changed significantly since I went to school. Right. And, you know, like, uh, I've seen it. I know a lot of people that do, uh, really. And I think that's, there's something really powerful about that because, you know, I think libraries have evolved. Right. And I don't even, a lot of people don't even call them libraries anymore because libraries, I I don't know. And maybe I'm totally hating myself is that the notion is that libraries books, right. But it's more than books in many of these spaces. Right. Um, so how have you seen some of that evolution, um, not only maybe of the spaces, but obviously of, of the work as well? Yeah, so that has been a lot of what we've done mm-hmm. as, as a group in our district, really kind of stopping and asking what are librarians trained to do? Yeah. What could they do to contribute to our core mission as a district and as schools? And are they doing that thing? Um, in a lot of cases, it seems to me like uh, we're we're paying a lot of money for folks to not do what they could do. Uh, right. But having said that, I don't I don't think it's important. And we're not talking about trying to shoehorn, like get back in that stereotypical box. Right. Um, so we we really are. They really are leaders in a lot of other areas in in providing rich experiences for students. But. Uh, the research is really, really clear. Um, you become a strong reader when you read a bunch and you yeah. don't read a bunch if you don't want to read what's in front of you. Right. And so to me, I, I maybe I'm wrong, but I make the claim that there's no such thing as a reluctant reader. There are only readers who don't like the books we've offered them. Right. So that's on us. Go find the books they love because over and over again, we find the, the right book, the right genre, and then a kid, a reluctant reader becomes this passionate reader. Uh, so we just can't, we can't give up. We have to keep pursuing, like, we just haven't found yours yet. How, how are we going to do that? So it's, it's really, it's really exciting um, to me, invigorating work. Like this is our core mission as a, right. what's the most fundamental thing a school does, I think, is teaching kids to, to be able to read and to read well and often. Um, it's right there with that core mission. Yeah. And, I, and hey, shout out to all the librarians out there, by the way. Right. <laughs> Love it. So uh, as I'm listening to you, I was, you know, obviously going back to my high school experience and I actually remember um, my librarian, uh, it, weirdly enough, it was the only place that I was actually encouraged to read books or things that I actually liked. Right. Yeah. So like in my classrooms, it was like, you know, and I'm not saying don't read the great Gatsby, but I'm not interested in that stuff. And that that's, I'm not a, I'm not a, I've just never been a fiction reader and that's okay. Right. And some people don't like nonfiction and that's okay. But if, right. but reading stuff. Right. But I remember actually, I could tell you her name, Heather Albers was a librarian and the new sports illustrated uh, every time it would come out because she knew I loved it. She, yeah. I would, she would have it ready for me to go. Cause that was literally yeah. what I read, uh, the most. And, uh, I always share the story. Rick Riley wrote the back, uh, page article and I loved it. And he would take sports and connect it to emotion. Love and it. I would try to bring that into the classroom several times. And I would say like, Oh, that's not real reading. Cause it's a magazine yet. Rick Riley actually has probably the biggest influence on my writing to this day. Love it. I, was I love story. that. 
I was discouraged in classrooms of reading that, but the librarian, because they, because like, and that's one of the tricks for librarians is that they probably see the most students in a day and to actually yes. know, know kids and know who they are and know what things that right. will get them excited about reading. Um, there, there's a real power in this. Okay. I got to ask you this question and I, All right. I am a sports guy, right? All right. So Nick Saban, I mean, yes. I don't, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't know if this will get you in trouble in Alabama, I, depending upon what your answer is. Nick Bring Saban it. is probably, probably the most successful college football coach of all time, right? Like everyone in Alabama would agree with that statement. Well, except for if you're an Auburn fan, correct? Right, right. <laughs> everyone who's right, right agrees with that. Right. Okay. So, I want you. I want to actually. I want to see. I don't know if you've ever been asked this question, but I, I know you're going to have an answer. So, Nick Saban obviously is to be a great coach you have to be a great teacher what yeah. what attributes of like because nick saban's not really like he's kind of like a bill belichick with media yes. but obviously yes. he's like beloved by players i think yes or at least right so like yes. what what characteristics of a great teacher do you see in nick saban i, I, I love that question saban. i love that by the way i have a, a, a an educator friend that probably once a week quote tweets something and says Nick Saban for everything. <laughs> Look, if, if Nick Saban becomes governor and wants to fix education, right. I'll, I'll help. Right. Um, right. But no, so characteristics that he demonstrates a, yeah. of, of an exemplary teacher. So the first thing is he knows his content area, right? Like he's always yeah. studying, like he knows he, you're not going to outwork him. Like right. he's all preparing Two. If you, you you may not see it very often in a game, but if you watch like documentaries or interviews and things like that, he's so good at building relationships with his folks. Yeah, like he invests in people all the time, and so he knows his people. He knows like it look like he's barking at people. He's being tough on them. Like look that that is right. That works because people know that he he is toughening them up. He's building them up to what they can be including folk, uh, players that consistently come back and just talk yeah. about how, how much of an influence he's had on them. Um, and then I, I, uh, I'll say something that is really less about coaching, but about a, a, a characteristic he displays. Um, I feel like he is an example of someone who uh, cares less about your past than about what you're willing to do today. Right. So look at all of the assistant coaches like it's almost a running joke like he's running a coaching rehab program right, here right but like to me that speaks to and another uh, so another great leader for me would be uh albus dumbledore right like it it doesn't the problems other people have with you are less important than what are you doing today what are you right. willing to contribute and so i'll stop there but to me he um He's not at all. I don't. I, I don't know that anyone would call him warm and cuddly. But he knows what he's doing. He right. he builds relationships with people, and he he cares more about do what you need to do than about any of the other stuff that goes on. I just look if if as a teacher you can do those things, you got a pretty good shot at success. So that that's actually what you just said about the warm and cuddly thing. That's one of the reasons I want to ask you because I think there is a perception that for teachers to build relationships with students, you have to be warm and cuddly, right? And I and I actually don't necessarily believe that. I think there's different ways no. and and sometimes uh the warm and cuddly does actually build relationships maybe with some sure. students different than, you know, some of the, like, I think different personalities, you know, mesh with right. one another. The thing with Nick Saban, and I know, I know this is a educate. I actually, I'm going to tell you straight up when I asked that question, I'm like, that's probably one of my favorite questions I've asked on my podcast. I love that. There that you was, go. That was a good question. I'm pretty proud of that. One. You nailed it. Yeah. So the, so the, the reason, and uh, I loved it is that you talked about him knowing his content but also relationships. And if you actually look, if you follow college football, he's changed. Like he used to be like a totally running coach. Yes. Uh, it was all about running. He's got way more into passing because he actually, he knows his content area so well, right. but he also builds relationships that he can actually change the way that he coaches based on, yes. on his knowledge of the game and who uh, his personnel which I actually Absolutely. think is really important. And I think for me, when I, when I do like workshops and stuff like this too, um, I actually, I work with a lot of groups and they'll say like, what are you doing? Like, you know, you're going to talk for an hour, but then what are you going to do after? Like, I want to know the schedule. I'm like, I don't know. 
who I'm talking to. I got to get to know right. these people. Absolutely. And I said, but I know my content. Don't worry about right. it. I'll figure it out based on who I'm working with in the room. That's beautiful. Right. That's and I beautiful. think that to me, like that, I, you know, I felt really validated when he said that because that's an approach. That's an approach is that if he gets different personnel next year, it's not, mm -hmm. he, he knows the game, but he right. builds it around the people he, you know, connects with. So I, I, I really appreciate hey. that. So when when you use that next time, use the educational buzzword differentiation. That's what he's doing. Right. He's right. saying, I know my people. I'm differentiating my plan to the situation. That come on, we could go on and on. It's it's good stuff. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's interesting. Well, hopefully, hopefully, uh, hopefully you're right on your prediction. I'm sure. I'm. It's gonna be. It's Alabama and Georgia, correct? Alabama and Georgia. That's gonna be. That's gonna be an interesting game, right? Because it's gonna be. A, it's a little revenge game for Georgia. <laughs> Alabama right. and Georgia, right? Alabama, right? I just, I, I am, I've got friends who are absolutely confident and, uh, the more <laughs> confident I am, the less sure I, I know what I'm talking about. That's right. Hey, so let's, uh, I want to ask you about your book, uh, the elephant in the classroom and the, the subtitle is tracing the complexity of teaching by exploring 13 competencies and practices. So when we were talking and you, you mentioned this briefly, you know, already in this podcast, you are basically answering the question, like, what is teaching? So we have like a consistent uh, kind of definition and, and really kind of thinking about that. So like, what, what did you, you know, in your research and your writing, like, what is the, is there a short answer to this or like at least a, a, a trailer answer to, to the book that you could kind of get people started with, uh, that are wanting to dig in more? No, <laughs> um, um, here, here, the book's right here. And right. I, I can give you one image. Sure. Uh, and so, uh, here, here you go. This is a black and white version of the image. Like, yeah, you're gonna have to explain fact, it because most people listen on uh, on 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 Apple Podcasts. So I, I got you. So what what I'm showing you here is an image that shows uh, these uh, uh, 13 competencies and practices and how they interact. So these, my research suggests that th these are all distinct from each other, but very tightly intertwined with each other. Right. So, for example. Uh, um, you have to know students. That's yep. a like, a, and by the way, all 13 are entire domains. They're not single things. So right. like we could talk, we, we could do six podcasts on all the different ways in which you, you can and should know your students. Right. Uh, we've just mentioned a minute ago, you have to know your subject matter. Yep. You, you need to have pedagogical expertise, meaning you have to know which, approaches to a specific topic uh, or a, a, a certain level of knowledge work better than other ways to teach yeah. that. And then you can take those three sets of knowledges and create a plan and then on and on. I'm not going to read all of them, but right. the, those, those thir and then there's some of them that, that are perhaps in what we, you would think of as the act of teaching. So like, yeah when you say that person is teaching right now, so like engaging students, uh, um, uh, uh, providing, let me see here, uh, implementing effective strategies, providing authentic learning experience, like what uh, th those just at first blush, you would say, well, aren't those the same thing? Right. And we dig in and say how you can't separate them from each other, but they're, they're not the same thing. Right. right. Um, so, I don't know. I, I I'm failing you on this one. Like that's the whole point. And this book is is based on on my dissertation study. And and I had members of the committee that said it's too much. You need to cut it down. And I say that's the entire point. The entire point is mm -hmm. teaching is so complex that we don't we don't have any way to hold the entirety of it. We don't even have think of it this way, like a satellite image. Right. Like it's, it's this massive forest and we're down here studying leaves and branches and right. we forgot the shape of the entire forest. It's not like it's a surprise to us. So uh, that that I'm sorry, everyone. No, that's the entire point. Teaching right. is massively complex. And I think I would argue it's silly to think that any one person has mastered all of teaching. Like yeah. I don't. I don't see how you can't live long enough to do that. Right. And this, like we were talking about this before and like um, you said, there's, there's 13 uh, areas that you uh, identify 13, 13 competencies and practices. And right. um, one of the things that, 
you know, uh, we both are really adamant about is the notion of like knowing students, like building relationships, right? And so when you look at those things, do you see them as like an equal, like we, we talked about this, that, um, right. if you're good at 12, but you don't know your students, right. then that's going to be an issue. Right. Um, and like probably, and this is always the question that I always struggle with is like, I can't get you to like people, right? right. Like if you don't right. like kids, we're in trouble. Right. But like, do you, do you see like, um, do you see these as kind of an equal weighting or are they all like have, you know, specific, you know, is there like, like, for example, knowing students, here's a question right. for you. How do you, what are some suggestions or strategies for teachers to do this? Right. Like, cause I know we can kind of dig into like, what does that mean? But like, what are some ways that teachers can do this where you have the Nick Sabins of the world and then, you Love know, uh, the opposite personalities, what are some ways that we can do that? Yeah. So, all right, I'm going to start with that last part first. Like if you, if, if the question is how do I know my students better? Um, you have to be intentional about that. You have to talk yeah. to them yeah. and you have to ask them questions. Um, like, uh, be, be, uh, be a student of your students, right? Like a ask them, uh, things that aren't related to your subject area. Mm -hmm. What are your hobbies? What are your interests? What team are you on? Um, and, and then look, if you have a terrible memory, like I do, well then make a spreadsheet or keep notes. Like right. not, don't interrogate the kid and write it down in front of them, but like keep notes and remember, uh, uh, George is really fascinated with college football. So right. after the game, look at him and say, oh my gosh, did you see that interception? Right. That is knowing and that provides a connection with him and that itself won't make him learn math better, but it will lower his guard a little bit. It will it will put him in a place where he can be receptive to the other things you do as part of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and this is the thing, George, like humans are incredibly complex. So there isn't yeah. one thing to do. And you said earlier different uh, so teachers need to uh, there's nothing wrong with teachers having different personality types and different right. approaches themselves so just because you're gruff doesn't mean you're hateful to kids right? right right and so maybe there are kids that that's what they actually connect with so i want to say something I, I said on the short broadcast is if you treat no matter what your personality is or your approach if you treat each of your students with dignity all right. the time then your style is fine. Right. Um, and, and to your to your bigger question, do these things hold equal weight? Like th my research in the book wasn't intended to explore how these things interact with each other and which is more important. It, it it's it's meant it was meant as an exploration, like to to right. notice. Um, so what I would say is, um, if you uh, describe someone. Uh, so your example was someone who is good at instruction, right? Really good at planning, but doesn't know how to know students. The right. argument would actually be they're not teaching. Right. Like that's not yeah. all that's right. of teaching. It's incomplete. That doesn't mean that it has no value. But then there are some things on here that the research and what the profession expects of a teacher. There are a couple of them that I think a lot of times get lost. I mentioned reflection earlier. We talk about the importance of reflection, but how many, how often, I don't know if you've ever heard of someone getting written up because they weren't reflective enough. Right. I mean, that would right. shock me. Like, no, you right. don't write someone up for that. You write them up because they're insubordinate because they didn't do their lesson plans or something like that. Right. But research says, if you're not reflecting, you're not doing all of teaching. And, and right. that's really the point is, there's, it's so vastly complex and there's a mismatch between the complexity of teaching and the rights and privileges that are afforded the professionals that do this. Other professions, you know, are, are very complex and right. then there's a better match. Uh, so is your, yeah. like, as you're talking about this, so I'm going through my Rolodex of memories and thinking, did we ever actually talk about what teaching is? as a staff member like like we we yeah. do this pd right um on this stuff this stuff right but like 
then everyone kind of scurries off, does their own version of these things. Right. And like, you know, when we're talking about, um, uh, personalities, right. I, I think there's, there's always like, uh, there's these, there's books that are like, teach like this, teach like this, teach like this. Right. right? And I can tell you straight up that I will never be the person that stands up on a desk is like, you know, uh, Robin Williams, dead poet society. That's not right. my personality. Right. right. And I think that it actually, uh, sometimes I like, I think it's like, would I want my kid in a class like that? Probably like, yeah, that'd be great. But it's not like, that's the only way it's more important right. to me. What you, what your kind of philosophy of maybe learning is in some ways, right. like what do you expect from kids through that process? Right. Yes. So I think try to like center the conversation is like, what do we actually get kids to do um, right. through this process? So when you're, do you see, or have you seen effective ways where staff administrators maybe just lead the conversations? Cause I've, I've promoted this for a while. It's like, you actually have to kind of like, like we have a lot of times their teachers are evaluated based on things they've never had a conversation about when it's like, they're not really, they're not. So it's like, Hey, you're expected to do this, even though like, you know, cause it was written by someone else, blah, blah, blah. But like the car, like, do we, do you, have you ever seen this effectively done where, you know, administrators, staff are actually having these conversations on right. what teaching actually is? Yeah. Uh, as a teacher, I've been part of, that practice a couple of times and i mentioned my my time in san diego mm -hmm. that was kind of a systematic and it, it it wasn't in the maybe framework that i the way i'm thinking of it in this book but it was basically there are some number of things that we know are really critical to being successful and so we will all stay on this path of learning right. how to gain competence of this thing and it's it's we don't demand expertise or high levels of excellence or or or, or being the best we just insist on growth like mm -hmm. you need to continue progressing at, as an educator um but the flip side of that so the answer to your question is yes i have seen that right the flip side of that is that in my experience is very rare because right. and, and so with, consider too how very difficult that is for a principal to do today um look at things like attrition uh, i've seen expressed for example a, a, a school's retention of employees but it's usually like year over year right. so here's a question for any given school what percentage of your faculty was here three years ago or right. five years ago like, are you together growing or is it a, you know, do you have a federation of folks that are not, haven't had the opportunity to learn together? Right. So that whole, like, so what should we do next is in fairness to school leaders, very difficult to do because you're going over the same ground with some folks. And as you say, we've, I've never heard about this for others or we have all this jargon we throw around that we give it a fancy title and they do know they just don't know mm -hmm. by that name you know we 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 uh we use uh, uh product names as verbs right you know like we're gonna dibbles i don't know if you're familiar dibbles like a, a test no. at the elementary level like we're gonna dibble the kids i'm like it's the <laughs> it's the name of a product right, right? like right 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 assess their learning right but that's i mean you could give another example of uh products as verbs um instead of what is effective practice and no matter right. what tales how do i continue to get better at that okay so i got i got maybe a little bit of analogy and we'll connect it back to alabama football right so you you talk about attrition right but alabama has players that maximum maybe five years there right, right. so they'll maybe redshirt one year and then they'll play for four yeah, there's a consistency in the program, right? Yes. And so there's, so like, I think there's, it's not that it's impossible to do those things because we see it done well in other yes. organizations because like the maximum amount of time a player is going to be in that system is five years. There's going to be right. a new player replace them, but they still actually have to like kind of, there's still a model of what they do for with Alabama That's football. It. So I think there, there's a connection there. Um, the, the, one of the reasons I ask you this question is because like there's an inconsistency um, 
in like expectations from administrators and it throws teachers off. And I'll give you like a, so I do a lot of work with technology. And so you see, so um, one of the things that we were evaluated on as teachers in Alberta, Canada, where I live was like how you use technology in the classroom, right? right. So, so you have administrator A walk into a classroom and they see a teacher using a smart board and like moving mm -hmm. stuff and like mm -hmm. touching it and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, wow, like you are so good with technology. This is absolutely incredible. And, you know, they're, you know, flying because a lot of times that administrator doesn't know anything about technology. They don't know how to use I, it. I've, I've had school. that exact experience. Go right. on. But then you have administrator B walk in that same classroom and say like, hey, like, that's cool. You use a smart board, but I'm not actually seeing kids use technology to learn at all. So like, yeah. it's more about what you do, but it's not necessarily what the kids are doing because uh, with that utilization of technology, right? right? But the extra tape, but so like, I don't blame the teachers in this situation because a lot of times they like adapt to what that administrator wants because they're nervous about evaluations, things like this too, as opposed to like, hey, what is the, cons what is the consistent expectation that we have like across right. the way. So if we're in the same school district and principal comes from one school to another, it's right. not like just, you know, it's not just like moving from one program to another. Right. There's a consistency. Like, so like, how do you, like, how do you see kind of that connection between like where, because I think that's why this, why what you're writing and what you're talking about is so important is because it's, it's hard to, maintain expectations as a teacher right. when a new person comes in and the expectations totally change like the print i'm like a big believer the principal is the most important pe personal organization yes. oh, because sure. because they affect so many people and they're the closest they're the they have the most authority closest to kids right so like Correct. as long as you have a good personality parents like you then right. you don't get complaints to the central office and so superintendents right. will leave you alone but your expectations could be wildly different from and then, you know, teachers yes. are like, well, I don't, I don't know what to do with this person. This, this, you know, she's this principal, she's totally different than this one. That's, you know, thought this way. So like, like, how do you see kind of that? How do you bridge that connection where there is like, it's not about the personality. It's more about, right. you know, the, the, ex the expectation being consistent across the board. I got a couple of things. First of all, um, I, I hope it doesn't hurt your heart and you don't cut me off immediately, but right. in my research, uh, using technology is not one of the 13 competencies. Yeah. And I actually address it like I think people would argue that it is. But I make the case that today you uh, uh, the, the abstract expectation of teaching includes the use of technology. Yep. But it runs across multiple of those competencies. Like it's not right. its own thing. Right. Back, back to your question, though. Um, you mentioned football, why that works for them, that they have turnover and continue to be strong is that they have a structure that's similar to the, the districts and the parts of the world that are very, very good at public education, which is mentoring the younger professionals is a, is a, a normal part of the job. So mm -hmm. if you're on the football team, part of your job is to train the younger ones Right. to play your position um, in, in places around the world. And if you've read the, uh, the work of uh, Linda Darling Hammond and others, what these places have in common, it's that every teacher in these, in these systems are mentored, is mentored right. by someone, and uh, uh, you're expected to be mentored as well. Right. Um, so to me, that's, that's the answer. And it's not about who is supervising you. And I admire a handful of teachers I've worked with who understand what accomplished teaching means, the view, the research based, this is teaching and have pursued that and have learned when I have a principal that doesn't think that's important, I'll figure out how to give them what they want and continue. And then if it gets bad enough and they actively stop me from growing as a teacher, I'll go somewhere where they will value what I am. Mm -hmm. To me, that speaks to a flaw in our system that, and you know, we were, we're huge on local control. Um, and we can argue the merits of that, 
But one of the things local control provides is the freedom to do things badly. And there's just no two ways about that was a bad decision. That was, But you have the legal right to do that as, right. as a school board, as a superintendent, whatever, as, as a principal. So I, I, I think the answer to what you're talking about lies in uh, of pushing back as educators against uh, the notion of like who says you get to be the arbiter of what excellence in teaching is mr or miss principal like collectively we understand what good teaching is right um having said that that takes a whole lot of courage to have that attitude when you don't hold tenure or when you're a new teacher and totally. your job's on the line um but i mean that that can be a call to action too is to say um i assume that i got get a, a lot wrong so collectively we, uh, we have an understanding of where we're headed as professionals towards accomplished practice um and and no one person should hold kind of be a gatekeeper of what accomplished practice looks like well we and we, like you talked about the the notion of mentorship and i think that's that's really important but I, but i think it's also that we have the ability to learn from any staff member Yes. no matter where they are in their career, first year, yes. last year, whatever. And uh, one of the things that I used to do as an administrator, and this might sound, this is gonna, some people don't like that I used to do this. I used to actually try to put um, people that were interview positions into situations where they had to like disagree with me mm. and, and kind of talk about like why they disagreed with me. So Good. sometimes I would maybe take a stand on something that I didn't actually believe, but I just want to see how they right. interact. And part right. of the reason was I wanted them to be able to say like, yeah, well, here's why I believe this thing and here's why. But I, I know this is going to sound weird. If they just agreed with me when like I would like outright disagree with them on something and they would just change their mind, that was actually something that I didn't want. I wanted right. them to say like, because I wanted those conversations. And I think it's kind of nurturing that too, because sometimes it actually is detrimental when we just agree Right. because it's our boss right? right and so how does that actually help kids that's that's right. always my question right and i would actually like talk them you know like hey here's why we had that conversation here's why because on our staff it's not about your idea or my idea it's about the best idea and we have to figure that out right together. right and right i think i think to me you know the i know a lot of teachers are listening to this right now and they're like well i have a really hard time with my administrator and the reason right. i'm sharing this is for those administrators saying, Good. do you actually create a culture right. where where actually challenge it? You know, as long as it's respectful, right? Like if, if you're like if you're like, hey, I don't agree with you, stupid. Then that, that's, <laughs> a, that's a totally different right. thing, right? Right. Um, I, I'm actually I'm curious about because you you mentioned the technology thing, and I'm I, like I I think a lot of times the I think because I'm comfortable with technology, people think that I'm like, oh, technology is the answer, <laughs> right? right? But the the reality of it is. A lot of times when we talk about teaching, schools will just throw devices into a classroom yes. and thinking everything changes. I'm like, well, you, there's nothing that's changed about your approach. You just added this random thing into it, but never right. really talked about what does it affect learning. But I, but I, and I always kind of struggle with this, too, because um, because there is a, there is connection to learning. Right. So right. a lot of teachers would complain that a kid can't write cursive but also some of those same teachers wouldn't be able to figure out how to get onto zoom <laughs> right, right right and so like so like if you say to if you're say i'm not good with technology sometimes i struggle with that because it's like well i'm not good at learning and figuring stuff out whereas exactly. some kids actually have that ability so i think it's not necessarily that like it's kind of like i don't think technology is the answer but if you mm -hmm. actually don't think that you have to learn like have the ability to learn. That's, I, that's where I, I like, I always kind of like wrestle with those ideas in my head. Cause I like, I'm with you, like, and I've seen it, I, you know, like if we get this program, I'm like, then what? Like you, you just right. you're going to do the same thing. Plus the program, like how does right, that right, change right. anything? Right. Right. So like, how do you, how do you see, and I, and like, this is one of the questions I kind of thought about as I'm listening to you. When is the point where we get students to a space where they don't necessarily need a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. And I, and like, is that ever happened? And especially like 
we were talking about um, librarians before, you know, inspiring kids to read. I think if you can inspire a kid to want to read on their own, you've done, you you become a success, right? right. In, in the work. So like where we have this access to just inordinate amounts of information right? and like how we dissect things, like where, where is there kind of like, I, I don't, I'm trying to think of the term where we kind of like let go and it's like, now it's on the learner. Like the teaching right. is to teach learning. Correct. But then when do we kind of release that, that, that space, I guess. I, it, it seems to me that the outcome you've just described should be the goal of, right. of schooling. We should be saying, uh, we aren't for a go back to reading. We're not trying to produce high test scores. We're trying to produce readers, people yep. who can and do read uh, in the other areas, uh, both the content areas and then habits of mind and, right. and, and ability to think, et cetera. Uh, so, so for me, the whole, the whole notion of scaffolding, for example, like it's funny how that that's one example of, we understand the noun scaffold and that the entire purpose of a scaffold is to do a thing and then take down the scaffold and leave the other thing there. Except when we do scaffolding in, in school, sometimes that looks like telling kids what to put on the worksheet or something like right, that. Right. Um, so, so for me, this, uh, a thought that sparked when you were talking there about technology, I, I, I mentioned I, I participated in a doctoral program on instructional technology. And one of the first conversations we have is just like, what is technology? Yeah. Um, and by definition, a thing that helps you do a thing right. is like technology. A like a pencil. It is. So, you, so you're talking about uh, a Google, Google Docs right. versus a piece of paper. Okay, well, then go back an iteration um, how, how did the proliferation of, of leaves of paper transform the way learning happened from, from slates to, to having paper? Right. And if the answer is it didn't really, then we're, we're not, we're not advancing students' ability to learn. And I think that's the missing piece with technology is right. this is where your understanding of the learning goals both the content, but also what is it that students are supposed to know and be able to do at a really, I think, meta level. So writing, if we just say they need to write well, but what is writing? And right. so this is conveying of ideas. So if you say the really important thing is the conveying of ideas and one form of that will be written, whether that's typewritten or handwritten. Right. Uh, 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 ideas. Now we can say, oh, does this tool help students progress towards proficiency better than another option? Mm -hmm. an, an observation I've made is that the teachers that from my perspective were the very best uh, at implementing technology in the classroom for learning mm -hmm. and champions of doing that were also the best at insisting when not to use technology because sure. they thought right now it would actually impede the learning goal if we used a technological uh, program or device or something like that so no i'm sorry you can't use your chromebook right now mm -hmm. um there's no such thing as a chromebook diorama like we're doing i just made that up that's probably a bad right. example right or, or, probably, or, or, probably, maybe there is now who knows probably I someone know. edited it just by listening to this but that's you know that's yeah there right. you go patent pending um, but, but that, so to me, that whole mindset of, I feel like we feel, we think that technology has some kind of magic where right. it's just a super powerful amplifier. So if you're, if you're engaging in poor practice, right. you'll do poor practice a lot, a lot louder and a lot more. Right. right. So faster. Get back you'll hear faster, right? Faster. You'll be back Absolutely. Faster. It, the, yeah. that, like as I'm as thinking about, you know, some of the things that you said, like we know like a hammer's technology, like a pencil's right. technology. But I think what we refer to as technology, I think this is really every generation, is things that were invented when we there were when we were alive, right? So I see the iPhone as technology, but my kids don't. They just yeah. see it as a thing that exists, right? right? They don't think right. of it that way. So it's like kind of doing this we, we we don't i don't think we recorded this but we were talking i think you mentioned samra model at some point yeah. and i i had a massive issue with the samra model and in the way that it was not 
not Ruben Pentadura's interpretation of it, but the interpretation of what it was in the classroom. And you kind of touched right. on it a little bit. Right. Is that you have on basically this is how a lot of schools were using this. You have levels. You have the lowest level. You have substitution. Like, are you doing something you could have done without yeah. this device, right? Or and then you have redefinition at the lowest. And like it was like it was never it was never implemented by curriculum people it was in, implemented right. by people that went to tech conferences and things like this right <laughs> right so 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 then you have a you go into a classroom you see a kid writing on an ipad right. and then someone comes in and says you know that's just substitution they could be writing on this and you're like but the kid never writes right 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 right, right. Now, exactly. now i got them writing right? exactly and that's the thing but then you see on the other side of the spectrum, they're like, wow, we're doing these videos and look at these kids doing this. I'm like, well, that kid has a million followers on TikTok. Like, exactly. Right. right. So like, so the, the thing that I always ask is you, you shouldn't be using this. The question you should be asking, is this transformative to the there learner? You go. Right. There is you this go. actually helping the kid? Are we using something in a way that helps this kid if they didn't have access to this? Right. And I think that's because I think it's, it was a very like technology focused model right. not necessarily like how is this actually helping the learner um one of one of the things that you also mentioned i i always talk about this uh and i think it's so i like my first year teaching just full of energy could tell stories like yeah. it was just like kids would just listen to everything i said you know and i was just like really engaging and things like this and i actually remember i was teaching grade four and then my kids went to a grade five class and uh those students would come and visit me They're like mr Kroos, like you know this teacher we have right now is like just so boring like they make us like do stuff and we're like writing all the time and and i was like oh my god like i created that issue yeah right? yeah like, because it was all about how i like it's all it was really like george centric if that makes sense there you go like, there you go really getting them excited about me but once mm -hmm. i'm pulled out of the equation they couldn't figure out where the teacher in grade five was actually teaching them how to learn yeah right yeah and so yeah. Like, like do you know and that's where i've always kind of struggled with this is that it's really like the the art of teaching i know that you talk about the complexity of it is really how do we get you know students to be able to go learn on their own yeah, right absolutely. and i i actually think in my first years of teaching i did the opposite right it was like you know it's dependent on me like if i don't show up you're in trouble Right. All right. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to spark off you there. And for yeah. me, the, the thing that worked for me was I would, uh, nudge and guide and lead these discussions. Yeah. And then, it, but I started to realize that if I don't ask key questions and right. point forward, that yeah. was just them watching for cues from me and they would have these epiphanies. I'm like, I basically planted that idea. Right. right? Yeah. Instead of, teaching them how to formulate their own questions. Right. Uh, so yeah, I, I totally identify with that and, and asking your, asking yourself, how do you, how is it not just about compliance? And I think there's right. a tie in the teachers too. Like we have this profession that very much rewards and in a lot of ways demands compliance. Like you're mm -hmm. going to do the thing, like you said, with the, the principal that insists on their way or things like that. Um, and, and we train people out of asking questions and growing and things like that. And then as someone pointed out, uh, they, they said, uh, especially because of tenure for a lot of teachers, there's a specific disadvantage right. to, to getting better, right? Like why there's, there's nothing in it for me to get better right. at my craft um unlike other professions where the better you get the 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 right. more stuff, different whatever. incentives yeah yeah so i i think that whole i mean this speaks to the larger construct of education like it it where, where did we start thinking or I, I don't know the answer but where do we start thinking that the, th the thing was compliance right. it, it, it never was right. supposed to be about compliance it was about training your mind and and right. learning to learn yeah Oh yeah, all right, Andrew, I'm gonna ask you one last question. That has nothing to do all with right. teaching. So right behind you, I see a record player. Yes. What's so what's give me like your a couple of records that you have back there? What what's what's some of your favorites? Uh so the one you're looking at right there, that's the Jackson Five. Oh, there you um, go. And I was listening to that earlier. And then I've got um what was I I got Jesus Christ Superstar, 
Uh, the I John. I've got Yellow Brick Road back there. So oh, I, it's uh, funny because I actually like I can like pop on music. It goes through my, uh, you know, ceiling speakers. I got nice. like a TV in front of me and all this other stuff. And I never use it. I only use my record player in this. Love room, it. Right? I love and it. it there's, it's weird because there's like a certain warmth and uh, and connection to that. Right. And it's kind of interesting because I had no interest in records when I was a kid. Right. Like the right. first the first thing I ever bought for music was not a record. It was a cassette tape. Right. There I can remember go. it was the Jets because I love the song Crush on You. So there you little, go. Little uh, uh, little uh, George trivia there. But Andrew, hey, thanks. <laughs> it was it was awesome talking to you about this. I, I, I hope that um, what I hope from this is that not only people check out your book, but they start having these conversations. Good. Right. Good. And I think that would be, you know, so beneficial because I think we talk about like this is such an important topic that we right. kind of just assume that everyone right. just agree we all agree but there's i think there is that that the like as you said the complexity we have to kind of get into it so if we don't have and the conversations it, right then people just kind of go off and are just doing whatever that's it and it's it's the elephant that's sitting right there yeah and the question i have is if you can see that there's an elephant sitting there what should you do about it right right well, hey, I, I'm going to encourage people to check out uh, Andrew's book, Elephant in the Classroom. You can see it in the description down below. Andrew, thank you so much for your time. I'm looking forward to people hearing this. And uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day.